This is my boomstick! Hello everybody, this is Tim here again uh, to do my review for Friday the 13th Part 2. Uh, just to kick straight into the film here, it's a pretty good sequel. I'd give it three stars out of a possible four. Uh, it's a really good movie. I don't think it's as good as the first film. The kills aren't as good and the suspense isn't as good. And uh, other than the, the other than Amy Steele and the guy that plays Paul Holt in this film, uh, the acting I don't think is as good as the first film. Uh, but uh, this film is still really good. I'd give it three stars out of a possible four. I really enjoy this sequel. I used to not like it that much when I first watched it a long time ago, but watching it again today, I actually enjoy it a lot more. But um, jump straight into this film here. Uh, you got a uh, Adrian King uh, from the first film, the hero of the first film, or Survivor. Uh, she's having like nightmares about the ending of the first film, and they kind of go along, go on a little bit too long. The dream sequence does, and I guess it's just there to catch people up who didn't see the first film to what happened in the first one. Uh, I like continuity in my horror films, but I feel like this goes on a little bit too long. Uh, but that's just me, personal taste thing. But um, so she's in her house and she's getting creeped out and everything, and. Uh, there's a fucking jump scare cat that jumps through the window. I hate jump scare cat. Uh, I hate this cliche. It's in so many movies. And just it not e It's in movies that aren't even horror films. I just fucking hate it. But uh, she opens up her fridge and it's a fucking Mrs. Voorhees head sitting in there. Which is cool. The makeup effects are good in this film for the kills and everything. And for Mrs. Voorhees head they look good. Jason comes up behind her like fucking grabs her in the throat and rams an ice pick into the side of her head. Which is entertaining. I enjoyed that. I thought that was cool. Um, it makes logical sense that, of course, Jason would go after the woman who killed his mom in this film. Uh, I'm not spoiling anything by saying Jason is the killer. Everybody knows Jason is the killer in this movie. <laughs> but um, to jump right into it here, I believe after that, the film skips five years. Uh, after that, I'm pretty sure the timeline for Friday the 13th franchise is, is a decent timeline, but it's not, very, it's not fleshed out entirely well. But I believe it's five years. Uh, oh, uh, before I forget... Like the uh, opening title of the first film with the Friday 13th title flying towards like some glass and breaking it, which I thought was really cool. This film, you get Friday 13th flying directly towards the screen and it just fucking explodes and part two appears in its place. And I'm like, hell yeah, baby. <laughs> that title, that was cool. I really like that. Not as much as the one from the first one, but I still really enjoyed it with the big explosion. I thought that was fucking awesome. But, um, so... To break down into this film, you got the character of uh, Jenny played by Amy Steele. Amy Steele, I like Amy Steele. She's really cute. She does fine in this film. She, uh, the woman, Alice from the first film, that character was fine. I like that character. But, um, well, she dies in this film and it's kind of like they were just like, just cut that, uh, what, uh, the remainder of the, the leftover stuff from the first film and just pushed it aside and, and uh, <laughs> So they could start off with their own story. So she's just kind of took out of the picture. <laughs> but Amy Steele, I like her. She's a much better character than Alice from the first film. She's much cooler. She uses the way she uses. She's majors in child psychology in the film. Her character does, and the way she uses it to outsmart Jason at the end is really fucking cool. And she fights back at Jason and kicks his ass a couple times, and she ain't taking no shit. <laughs> uh, Amy Steele does great playing her. She's fine. I really like her. She does terrific in the film. She's much better than the Alice character from the first one. Um, the guy that plays Paul, Paul is fine. He's 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 all right. I don't hate him or anything. He's he's decent. I, I enjoy watching that actor. He does fine. Uh, then you get fucking a complete copy character of the guy uh, Ned from the first film, who was the practical Joker. In this film, you got a guy named Ted. I just picture the writers going, "How can we make this character the same but different?" Fuck it, we'll call him Ted. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Uh, <laughs> He's his fucking same exact type of character as the one from the first film. He's another practical joker. And he doesn't even die in the film. He fuck, He's not as funny, so I don't give a shit about him, really. And plus, he's a copy character, so I don't give as much a shit about him. He fucking just goes to a bar in the movie and never comes back, so he doesn't even die. And I'm like, what, what the fuck was the point in that character? But anyway, um, this film has more people in it, like and promises a higher body count, but you don't get it. You don't get the higher body count <laughs> because half the fucking cast goes to the bar along with the practical Joker and they're never seen again. So I'm like, fucking waste. Don't promise me a higher body count if you can't deliver. What the fuck is the point? But anyway, that pissed me off. Uh, the kills in this film aren't as good. The suspense in this film isn't as good as the first one. The first one was better directed, but this film has Amy Steele. 
and it has a really creepy Jason who wears the potato sack. Well, not well. I think it might be a pillowcase, not a potato sack, but sack over his head, whatever. Huh, that looks really creepy. The hockey mask is more iconic and cooler, but uh, the sack is creepier with the one eye hole cut out of it is creepier. Um, I would be more creeped out by somebody like this than I would have doing the hockey mask. But anyway, so yeah, you got Jason in this film. Of, um, yeah. The this film hits a little bit too many of the same beats as the original. Like they're open, they have a counseling a counselor training center, like really close to uh, to the Crystal Lake camp. And uh, Paul Holtz, like the guy who runs it, and uh, Amy Still, Jenny, the character Jenny is his girlfriend, and they're kind of training counselors and everything. And it's like the same shit, similar to the first film, a little bit too close. Uh, but they're all training them there and everything. And as far as the as far as the kills go. You get, well, you get Crazy Ralph back in this film. I like Crazy Ralph, the character from the first one. He shows up in this one, says, We are doomed, and then dies. I'm like, okay. I felt like that was a waste. I felt like that was a waste for that character. I wanted more with Crazy Ralph. I felt like he was done away with too soon. And the way he dies, he's like sneaking around the camp and spying on people. And Jason comes up behind a tree and puts, I believe, some barbed wire around his neck. Uh, cut away from him, cut back. His head falls down. He's dead. And I'm like, okay, whatever. Uh, I thought that was a waste. But enough about negative things about this movie. Like I said, this film is not as good as the first film. It's a three-star film out of a possible four. It's not as good as the first one, but it's still pretty good. I still really enjoy this one. Despite the negative things I've laid out, this film is still really good. Um, it still feels creepy. This Friday 13th movie still feels creepy. This is before the films became iconic. Uh, that, this film still feels creepy. It's got the wood at, the woods in it again. Great location. It's got the creepy atmosphere in it. You got a rainstorm at the end of the movie. You got to have rain at the end of the movie to sell the creepiness better. And it's still got some really cool kills in it despite some lame ones. Um, but anyway, uh, so they're, uh, they're all at the camp. And um, you get Crazy Ralph dead. Uh, after that, you get these two characters, Jeff and Sandra, who fucking want to see the <laughs> Camp Crystal Lake camp, so they sneak there to go check it out. Uh, they're going there to check it out, and this cop, uh, well, the, as they're heading there, Jason, like, pops out from behind a tree, so it's, like, a little bit of creepiness there, but they don't run into Jason because a cop shows up and, uh, stops them, takes them back to the camp, and you get a funny scene here. Like I said, I like Amy Still, and I like the guy that plays Paul, um, the funny scene here where he's talking about you're not even gonna punish these two people. You're not even gonna punish the. You're not even gonna punish them for sneaking over there. And he's like, uh, Jenny, no seconds on dessert for Jeff and Sandra tonight. <laughs> I thought that was fucking funny. But uh, so as the cops leaving, he fucking sees Jason leap across the road and he gets out of the squad car and takes off chasing after him. I'm like, okay. <laughs> but it's a good chase though. I like this. And he makes it to Jason's shack. Jason has like a, a fucking rundown shack in this film, which is pretty neat. Um. He's got like a shrine built to his mother's head there with some dead corpses of people he's killed in the film. Uh, like uh, laying around it like a shrine to his mom's head, or to his palm, I mean. Which is cool. The cop finds it, and the, the cop gets hit in the back of the head with a hammer. Cool death scene. I enjoyed that one. I like that one. Uh, back at the camp, this is when you get fucking... They all decide to go to a bar, and the half the cast disappears, and they're never seen again. They never come back. <laughs> So I guess it must have been some badass beer. Alcohol just knock them out for the whole rest of the night. But uh, Amy Still and Paul, they both leave. Uh, back at the camp, Jason's wiping everybody out one by one. You get this chick who goes skinny dipping. She's got like a little dog, maybe a Pomeranian. I don't know. But Jason kills it off camera and like fucking rips it apart. And he's like, damn, Jason ain't fucking around. He even kills the dogs. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> or even the little dogs. But anyway... So little little dog uh, little dog's dead. I guess you can add that one to the body count, I guess. <laughs> but uh, you get this chick who's like goes skinny dipping and she gets naked. I believe you get a full frontal shot here. Uh, pretty hot, pretty good. I enjoyed that one. <laughs> I'd give it three stars just for that. But um, you get this dude who's like keeps trying to flirt with her. He fucking gets caught in his trap and gets hung upside down. It's cool to think about the idea of Jason setting traps like that. That's pretty neat. Like he's an animalistic hunter or something like that. Just seeing the character that way, the way he's represented in this film is pretty cool. So he gets hung upside down, uh, the girl goes to leave to get something to cut him down with, Jason grabs him by the head and slices his throat, he slices his throat with like the dull end of the machete or the, the one that you're not supposed to cut things with, so I'm like, okay, but uh, the effect with the blood coming down his throat like that and them hanging upside down is pretty cool. Uh, Tom Savini didn't do the effects in this film, I don't think. <clears throat> 
No, he didn't do them. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't do the effects. I don't. I don't remember who did the effects in this film, but it wasn't Tom Savini. The score by Harry Manfredini again uh, is good. The score in this film is good. I don't like it as much as the one from the first film, but it's still pretty damn good. Um, so there's no problems there, music wise, no problems. So she comes back and finds him there hanging dead. She freaks out and just turns around, and looks at the camera, and just looks fucking directly at the camera and goes, ah, and then just cuts away. And it's like, well, okay, what a death scene. Fucking useless. That was stupid. Uh, but, uh, so they're all at the bar. Amy, uh, Jenny is sitting there talking to Paul, talking about how she thinking, she's thinking about Jason, trying to put the legend in real terms and analyzing his, like, character from a child psychology, or child psychologist's point of view. And, no, <laughs> Jason supposedly drowned in the first film. This film tries to like give an explanation that, that maybe he survived his drowning or in, like living in the woods or roaming or something like that. All the films offer like different explanations for how Jason might survive. Maybe he was a supernatural entity, just came back from the dead. Maybe he survived his drowning, lived out in the woods for a couple years, or maybe he was brought back to life by the Necronomicon, something like that. But uh, it actually adds to the character. I think it makes the character like kind of like a campfire story. And in the film, you get like a you get a campfire scene where Paul's like telling the legend and basically explaining everything that happened in the first film. <laughs> Which is kinda cool. Uh and then you get the practical Joker who jumps up, uh like fucking scares everybody with a mask on and a spear in his hand. I hate this guy. I wish he would have died, but he didn't. <laughs> so um, I fucking useless again. But enough of me harping on the practical joker, back to the plot. Uh <laughs> but uh the guy that plays Paul, his dialogue right there for that scene was really good. I really enjoyed it for when he was talking about the stuff that happened in the first film, like The Legend of Jason. That was cool. Uh, I guess uh, supposedly it's like Jason saw his mom get her head chopped off, basically, and he's taken out his rage of not having a mom and his fucking vengeance on everybody invading his territory in this film and the films beyond. <laughs> so that's cool, the idea that Jason... Well, I mean, just the, that just makes you kind of feel even more sympathetic for Jason. Okay, we got a character here who was handicapped, fucking drowned in the water because nobody gave a shit about him other than his mom. Uh, <laughs> his mom well, went crazy, tried to kill people she viewed responsible for his death. She got her head chopped off. Jason saw his mom get her head chopped off. The only person he ever cared about is dead, and he's been alone for so many years living out in the woods, and now people are fucking with his territory. <laughs> so I'm like, and almost, you think about it that way, it kind of makes you root for Jason a little bit. <laughs> But yeah, I like the character of Jason. Uh, he hits like a more, way more emotional chords than than Michael Myers, and, and especially Freddy, who is a child molester. So yeah, he's much more easy to connect with and and root for, really. Uh, but uh, yeah, Jason's a cool character, despite the horrible things he's doing. You're always gonna feel a slight bit of sympathy for him, but that doesn't make him a good person anyway. But that makes him a good character. You can have a character where the audience slightly cares a little bit about him emotionally then you've succeeded to be honest you especially with even with all the horrible things they've done you succeeded but um back to to, to the, back to the kills uh that stupid ass death where she she gets killed off screen um hmm. oh the wheelchair guy oh i can't believe i almost forgot about the wheelchair guy baby i love this one this is one of my favorite deaths in the whole franchise there's this wheelchair guy thing and he dude in the wheelchair thing he's gonna get some and he's fucking just sitting there in his wheelchair and jason just pops out of nowhere hacks him in the face with a machete his fucking wheelchair rolls down this, these steps and it's thundering and lightning and all once the screen just freezes and cuts away like with a little white light just pops up and it's like fucking awesome i love that death that was awesome that was so cool that was one of the best deaths in the franchise loved it uh, next, you got Jeff and Sandra who are fucking. Um, so they're screwing each other's brains out. Jason gets that, gets the spear, walks up the stairs. He's gonna he uh, you get a double impalement here. It was done in another film before this. Uh, I think it might have been a Mario Bava film. I'm not for sure. Maybe Bay of Blood. I don't know. I don't, it might have been that film. I think that was one of his films. I'm not for sure. I haven't seen his films in so long. Uh, but uh. But anyway, it's still cool. The whole impalement is a great idea. And uh, so Jason walks up there. He's got the fucking spear and he just rams it through him. But you don't. I don't. One of the things I don't like about this is it feels cut. And I heard the scene was cut. And it looks cut, and I don't like that. The idea of it is cool, but the fact that it's cut uh, doesn't give it the impact it needs. But uh, he rams it through him, and then you just skip to the. You just go to the bottom of the bed, and the spear just hits straight towards the ground. And I'm disappointed in that. That wasn't as cool as it could have been. I didn't like that. But the idea of it is still awesome. 
But uh, so those two are dead. And then the girl that was going to fuck the guy in the wheelchair, I believe that guy's name was Mark. Uh, she goes up there. Uh, she pulls up. Well, she goes up to where Jeff and Sandra were, pulls off this fucking blanket, and chastens underneath there, which is cool. I like that little surprise. He hacks her in the leg. Uh, cut or cuts her in the leg, and then she moves backwards towards the wall. He fucking comes towards her, and he's got his knife in his hand like that, and he just moves slowly towards her and stabs her like right in the gut, I believe. That's a cool scene. I enjoyed that. That was decent little suspense there, like when he was gonna stab her, and he finally does, and she falls and she's dead. So that was cool. I enjoyed that. Um, so Amy Steele and uh, the character Paul, they come back from the bar. They're now at the camp. Uh, the Practical Joker and half the other cast never come back. But they're back there. Um, get some of the same shit here at the end, where uh, where Amy Steele's like finding some of the bodies again. She sees Crazy Ralph's body, uh, reminiscent of the first film where Alice was finding the bodies at the end of it. So I didn't really like that too much. Uh, too close to home for me for the too close to the first film. But uh, they're there, and you get a cool you do get a cool scene here where Paul's like in this other room, or well, they're in there, they're in this room, and. Uh, uh, Amy Steele's like looking around and fucking, uh, she's like, Paul, somebody's in this room. She's like, somebody's in this fucking room. And Jason pops up and jumps him and they get into a little struggle. And you think he's killed Paul, but he hasn't. Paul comes back later. And so this begins a really cool chase at the end here. I like this chase better than the chase from the first film. Uh, this final here, I like this final better than the one from the first film other than not ha Well, the ending of the first film, I like that decapitation at the end of it better than the ending of this one. But uh, the chase at the end of this one with the suspense and everything, with Jason chasing after uh, Amy Steele, the character Jenny, uh, is cooler, I believe. And I like the way it's filmed better, and I just like the way they do it better than the one from the first film. That's just me. But, uh, so Jason takes off chasing after her. Uh, you get some cool scenes here. She's back behind this door. Jason fucking rams a pitchfork through it. Jason looks like a hillbilly-looking guy in this one, but I still enjoy it. <laughs> it's cool. It go the his look goes with the fucking sack on his head. He rams a pitchfork through the wall through the through the door. She manages to get away. Uh, you get a scene where uh, she's fucking in this car and Jason stabbing the pitchfork through the top of the car and then she like hits him with the door and knocks him down. It's kind of a wussy hit, so he kind of just fell down a little bit too easy, I thought. But it's still it's still all good. <laughs> Nitpick there. Uh, so he's still chasing after they make it into this. Uh, well, they, uh, they're, he's still chasing after her. She fucking jumps up from behind a bush and knees him in the nuts. I'm like, oh, Jason, I feel your pain, man. I'll thank bring Jason down as a nut shot. That brings us all down. I, <laughs> that brings us all of us guys down, I believe. But that, that nut shot, I just thought that was funny and cool that she actually kneed him in the <laughs> fucking nuts. But anyway, um, so you get a scene where she's like, she uh, she jumps out at him with a fucking chainsaw. Like, trying to saw the shit out of him. And it dies. And she knocks him down. And then she picks up a fucking chair. And slams it on top of his ass. And I'm like, hell yeah, this motherfucker ain't screwing around. She ain't gonna go down. She ain't, not without a fight. That's what I like about this character. That's what makes her cooler to me than the woman. Than Alice, the character of Alice from the first film. So that's what I like about the character of Jenny. She's not fucking around. She ain't going down without a fight. So she fucking uh, watch, knocks the shit out of Jason. Then you get another scene where she's hiding underneath this bed. And uh, this fucking rat like comes by. And she like pisses herself. And I'm like okay. After everything, she's been, after everything she's been through so far. She pisses on herself because of a fucking rat. But whatever. <laughs> that was kind of stupid. Uh, and then she comes out from underneath the bed. Jason's standing there on this chair. And the fucking chair breaks. <laughs> and he misses her with the pitchfork that he has in his hands. And he falls and like hits the fucking ground. I thought that was funny because this is Jason's early years and he hasn't really perfected killing yet. So he, the fact that his plan, his own plan fucks up is kind of funny. So she manages to make it out of there. She's like running through the woods and you get a scene where Jason like jumps out to the side of the woods and leaps at her and tries to grab her. But she manages to dodge him, which I thought was cool. I enjoyed that too. Uh, you get like close-up shots towards the moon and everything and like Jason chasing after her. It's really spooky and creepy. I really enjoyed it. She manages to make it to Jason's shack. Uh, she, um... She finds Mrs. Voorhees' head in her sweater, takes her sweater, put it on, puts it on. Jason makes it in there. He's got his, uh, uh, well, well uh, he's got his machete. Uh, well, she's got Jason's machete. He's got a fucking hay fork. I think he's still got his hay fork. I don't, uh, I'm not for sure. Uh, but he makes it in there, and she's fucking pretending to be his mom. She styles her hair a little bit like her. And, uh, she, uh, she's talking to Jason's like, it's all done, Jason. Kneel down. Mommy's got a reward for you. And I'm like, this is badass. <laughs> uh, just the and just the way that she plays it is real cool. Uh, and just the idea of it is cool. 
and how she looks at Jason like studying him because he has like a child mind and trying to she comes up with that way as a way to as a way to outsmart him and beat him and I thought that was cool. It adds to her character and adds to the character of Jason, which some of the films don't do, but here it does and this one and I enjoyed that. Uh well, she uses her child. Well, I won't really say she studies the character of Jason, but she uses her child psychology that she knows to outsmart him, because Jason has more of a child like mine. But uh, the plan backfires when uh, well, you get cool scenes where Jason's looking at her and he sees like Betsy Palmer's face instead of hers, which is cool. But uh, the plan backfires when she she fucking moves out of the way a little bit too much. She's raising the machete up in there to hit him, and he sees his mom's head in the background on the table, and it's like, oh shit! <laughs> and then he swings at her. No, I think it's a pickaxe is what he's got. And he swings it at her and cuts her on the leg. She swings the machete down. Jason fucking blocks it. It's like, yeah. <laughs> he's like, badass, Jason. But he blocks it. And then Paul shows up. And him and Jason get to another fight. He manages to take Paul down. He's getting ready to kill Paul. Jenny comes up behind him with the machete. Fucking hacks him all the way through the side right here through the shoulder. Uh, Jason has never been human. Some people call him human Jason for the first, like, uh, for two, three, and four. Jason has never been human, regardless. I'd say humanistic Jason, really, would be a more appropriate title. No human could withstand the wounds that he gets in his movies. They, he just, they just couldn't. Even by movie logic, the, ones he, the wounds he gets in part three, uh, in the third film, are just way too severe. There's just no way. But, uh, she, like, and hacks him to the side like that. He falls down. Uh, they make it out of there. Uh, then you get... The most confusing ending in the history of these films. Well, I would say second. Maybe Jason Hex Manhattan is worse or more confusing. But the ending we get here, fucking Muffin was the name of the dog, the little Pomeranian dog that Jason supposedly killed in the movie. She fucking comes to the door and it's like, how the fuck is she still alive? So it's like, is the ending a dream or not? Which the ending has to be a dream because that dog, there's no way. I mean, the dog that was that it showed killed, that was like ripped apart, was obviously the same fucking dog. There's just no way that'd be that similar. There's just no way. But, uh, then Jason fucking like leaps through the back window towards Jenny and he's like got no mask on. He's got like uh, half his head shaved off on one side and then long hair on the other like hanging down like that. Uh, so um, that was kind of an interesting look for Jason to have real long hair like that. That was kind of interesting. I don't mind the look really. It looks decent. I don't have any problem with it. Uh, there's looks I like better but this one's still cool. But uh. Look in part 7, Fire 13th, the new blood will always be the definitive Jason look, no matter what, until somebody outdoes it, and so far they haven't. But, uh, but anyway, so he jumps through the back window like that, and Amy still, and then fucking the screen just cuts out, and then the next scene we got the ambulance like calling her off, and it's like, she's like, Paul, Paul, and it's like, well, you know, what the fuck happened to Paul? Because it's clear the ending has to be a dream. So I guess they were trying to duplicate like the ending of the first film with another dream and a jump scare. So I was like, what the fuck happened to Paul? And you get a close-up on Mrs. Voorhees' uh, head, and you're thinking, is it going to smile? Is her eye going to open up? But they don't do that, which, thank goodness, because that would have been too much of a cliche. And also would have made her character supernatural, and she was clearly not supernatural in the first one. But uh, the ending makes no sense. That's what caused me to knock it from four stars down to three. The ending just makes no fucking sense. No matter how you try to explain it, there's just no fucking way to explain it. It makes no sense. Uh, but yeah, this is a really good sequel. It's a pretty good movie on its own. On, on, I mean, on its own, it's a really good sequel. I'll give it three stars out of possible four. I really enjoy this movie. Um, I don't know which one's better. This one, or part three. I haven't seen part three in a long time, but I guess you'll hear my opinion on which one of those is better after I do my review for the third one. But as far as this goes, I really enjoy this film. Uh, it was a lot of fun. It's not as good as Halloween two from the Halloween franchise. Uh, I do like it better than Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise. But uh, that's just me. I just, well, I like it better inadvertently because I prefer this style to like black comedy style that Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 had. Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, <coughs> sorry, um, the Chop Top character in that is, I believe, is cooler than almost anything. Well, not almost anything, but it's cooler than uh, a bunch of stuff in this film. Not everything, because the chase scene at the end, the final, is really cool. And I like the character of Jason better than Chop Top. But just that character of Chop Top in the second Texas Chainsaw Massacre uh, really elevates that film. But I just prefer the darker style of this film over the style of Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. But uh, as, a, as a far as films go, as like a complete film, I would say... Uh, well, as far as like adding in and stuff like that and everything goes and characters and things like that and 
Well, the ending of Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 is better than the ending of this one. So, all together as a film, I would say Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 is better than this one. But I just prefer this film because I like the darker atmosphere. That's just me. But I will admit that Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 is a better film. But all in all, it's a really good film. A three-star film. I have a possible four. And I'll see you guys again with Friday 13th. Well, Friday the 13th had trouble spitting it out there. Friday the 13th, part 3D, baby. I'll see you guys again.